Hi class, welcome to your uh, lesson on the endocrine system. We're going to start with the introduction. So endocrinology is the study of the endocrine system, and uh, the endocrine system is made up of the glands that produce hormones. The um, effect of hormones uh, is that they coordinate specific responses. They communicate within and among local and distant cells and the nervous system. And signals received by the glands can promote a synthesis and or release um, of hormones. So um, one of the ways to think about this is like the nervous system is a wired system and the endocrine system is a wireless system, but it still interface some um, with the nervous system. So here are the major components of the endocrine system that we're going to look at. We have the hypothalamus, uh, the base of the brain with the pituitary attached to it. We have the thyroid that's over the, thro the throat, the um, larynx is right there, and the trachea is right there. And behind it, we have the parathyroid glands, the four parathyroid glands. And then we have the two adrenal glands that are sitting on top of the kidneys. And then we have the pancreas right there that we've studied already, but we're going to go, we'll go over a little bit of the endocrine portion of that. And then we have the testes and ovaries, testes in the male, obviously, and ovaries in the female for their reproductive system. All right, so control and command of the endocrine system. So there are circadian, diurnal, pulsatile, cyclic, and target level patterns. Circadian refers to a 24-hour cycle, but you're referring to kind of a day-night cycle. So if you think about um, you going to bed at the same time and going to sleep about the same time, every day and waking up about the same time every day, that would be an example of a circadian rhythm and uh, melatonin would be the hormone that is um, associated with it. It's also usually a trainable rhythm so that if you changed your date, your um, bedtime or getting up time, you, you could get used to either earlier or later bedtime or getting up time. A diurnal um, has to do with pattern during the daylight hours, so day hours, think diurnal, uh, and so these refer to hormones uh, whose patterns vary during the day according to a certain pattern. Cortisol would be an example. Uh, it does exhibit some diurnal variation where, and so does testosterone, but cortisol is and testosterone are both higher in the morning and lower at night. Pulsatile is if the uh, hormone is released kind of in a steady fashion, pulse-like, you know, release. Um, and then cyclic, according to a specific cycle. Um, and so we could think of with uh, the cyclical ones, like the female reproductive cycle, that could be one. And then target level, um, it, they are released to maintain a target level of hormone within uh, the blood. So um, there, uh, there's a concept of feedback loops also associated with that, and there are positive and negative feedback loops. The predominant feedback loop in the endocrine system is the negative feedback loop. Um, so in a negative feedback loop, it's uh, akin to a thermostat in a, in a room that controls temperature. So um, usually there's a set point. So in our thermostat example, that would be a certain temperature. And um, the according to the temperature that is uh, in the room or outside, either the heat or the air conditioning will kick on to try to maintain the temperature to the set level. So why is it a negative um, feedback loop? It's because it's trying to lessen the change away from the set point. So uh, let's say your your thermometer, your thermostat is set at 72 and now it's 80 degrees in the house. Well the AC will kick on to bring it from 80 degrees back down to 72 and lessen that difference between the 80 degrees and the 72 that it's supposed to be, bring it back down. If it's really cold and it's 60 degrees in the house, it will kick on with the heat to bring the temperature back up and lessen the change away from uh, from the set point going from 60 and heating it up to 72. So negative doesn't specifically mean that it brings a level down. It could bring the level up. It just means it lessens the change away from the set point, from the normal. Okay, and so the positive feedback loop then actually um, the the change away from normal is increasing. And so um, their, uh, cl the clotting system is an example of the positive 
um, feedback loop where it um, once the clotting is um, started it kind of in a way runs away with itself it's like a domino effect it keeps going and going and going and going and going until the a big enough clot has been established um, so until there's a certain outcome so um, and it is akin often to like a faucet turning on um, some more on the control and command more concepts we have the presence of receptors that have to that can bind the hormones to carry out their effects We'll talk a little in detail about this here in a minute. Uh, there are circulating enzymes that can degrade the hormones so they don't ha keep having effects uh, beyond what they're needed. Um, hydrophobic hormones come from the adrenal cortex. Hydrophobic means fearing water, which means will be your fat soluble hormones. And um, the endocrine system always works with the nervous system to regulate, to regulate your responses to internal and external stimuli. So, um, here again are all of it kind of put all together here. So we have the central nervous system uh, in a certain input, um, and so the um, central nervous system can can positively influence here the hypothalamus to to start releasing something, uh, and so it either sends a signal or a releasing hormone. Uh, so uh, releasing hormone, let's say we're going to use that for the anterior pituitary. So it sends a releasing hormone to the anterior pituitary. The anterior pituitary then releases a tropic hormone. And as it releases that, there is a short um, feedback loop that tells, okay, this has been released. So, you know, quit sending the signal, basically. So that's what that negative feedback loop says. But then that tropic hormone needs to go to the target organ and have its effect and once it has reached a target organ then that target or organ when that tropic hormone is bound to it uh, it will produce and release the hormones and then those hormones enter the bloodstream and uh, so there will be a shorter feedback loop to the anterior pituitary that says okay we've got the hormones produced and a longer one that goes to the hypothalamus again saying okay it can check it can see that the level of those hormones has come back up or down, but um, and it can sense uh, changes in positive or negative to hypothalamus can. And of course, as those hormones are released, there's a physiological effect. And that depends again on the hormone. So um, sometimes uh, it's the central nervous system that directly controls the hypothalamus. Sometimes it's an input. Uh, something has changed on the environment or whatever. So, so that's kind of a just very summarized um, system. So again, here's the negative feedback loop, lessens the change away from normal. It is the most common, almost every hormone is controlled by a negative feedback loop. And the cycles of secretion maintain physiological and homeostatic control. And again, um, they, it's usually has a target level that it's trying to maintain. Uh, and the cycles can range from hours to months in duration, depending on the hormone that you're looking at. So, um, Thyroid production uh, would be one of the examples of a negative feedback loop, and we're going to look at thyroid hormone production here in just a minute. And again, a positive feedback, it increases the change away from normal and clotting. Clotting and childbirth are two examples of po positive feedback loop. Um, so um, a quick look at the thyroid one as a negative feedback loop. You have the hypothalamus senses the amount of thyroid hormone in the blood and um, it sends a signal to release uh, in, uh, to the anterior pituitary. So it released thyrotropin release and hormone. And that's the signal and it's going to send it to the anterior pituitary. Here's the anterior pituitary. And it's going to release, in response to TRH, it's going to release TSH. TSH is also actually known as thyrotropin. So that's why that's thyrotropin releasing hormone. So when it gets that signal, it releases TSH, thyroid stimulating hormone. And then TSH is going to go to the thyroid gland and cause a release of T3 and T4. The levels of T3 and T4 will climb. That will make a negative feedback loop telling it to stop producing TSH and stop producing TRH. So there you go. That's a very basic negative feedback loop. All right. So the types of hormones that are found 
um, in the body. We have peptides and polypeptides. Of those, we have growth hormone, insulin, leptin, parathyroid hormone, prolactin, adicocorticotropic hormone, or ACTH, ADH, or antidiuretic hormone, calcitonin, endorphins, glucagon, and many more. They circulate freely in the blood because they are proteins, so they're water-soluble. Well, they're, they're, they're not really big proteins, but they're polypeptides, so just think protein-based, so water-soluble. And their half-life is usually a few minutes. Um, there are glycoproteins, so those are protein sugars, FSH, LH, and TSH are the three glycoproteins. Their half-life is also a few minutes, uh, and they also do not bind to other proteins in the blood because they are water-soluble. Then you have uh, your amine, like think amine, like amino acid, I mean, T3 and T4 are amines. Their half-life is a few days. Uh, and then you have epinephrine and norepinephrine, and their half-life is a few minutes. Um, these are made from tyrosine. And then you have your steroids. Uh, we have estrogen, your glucocorticoids like cortisol, your mineral corticoids, um, your progestins, and many, many more. Um, they are all made from cholesterol, and they must bind to protein because we know cholesterol is a fat. Fat's not water soluble, so it has to be transported on a protein. And then we have a few others that are arachidonic acid derivatives. Those are your, your eicosanoids. Um, they're made from polyunsaturated fatty acids. Uh, and these have to do with um, inflammation and other um, local, more local signals. All right, your protein hormones or protein-based hormones. Um, again, the majority of your hormones are either protein or polypeptides. They're synthesized and stored in secretory granules. Uh, they are water-soluble. They do not require carrier proteins since they are water-soluble. They all attach to cell membrane receptors. So outside of the cell, on the cell membrane, there's a receptor for that specific hormone, and it has to be able to bind to it in order for it to have its effect inside the cell. Um, once that hormone binds to the cell receptor, it will activate a messenger like cyclic AMP inside the cell, and uh, the downstream effect would be a protein synthesis or an enzyme activation within the cell. The steroid hormones are produced as needed. They must bind to a carrier transport protein because they are um, lipid soluble, they're not water soluble. And um, the hormone can passively diffuse into the cell. The reason is they are lipid soluble and your cell membrane is made of lipids. And so lipid can, um, you know, is soluble in lipids so it can actually just phase through the walls of the cell and go straight inside the cell. Uh, and then it does have receptors, um, and uh, it goes and finds this receptor and make a receptor ligand complex. The ligand would be the hormone. And, um, and usually the receptors are in the nucleus. So, for example, your steroid hormones bind uh, inside once they are inside the cell. So first they enter the cell, and then they go bind to the nuclear membrane receptors. And then that binding produces an activated hormone receptor complex and then that usually turns a gene on or off sometimes so uh, so when it, it binds then you have DNA transcription and replication that happens and uh, it happens in response to the activated hormone receptor complex um, and it activates bounds the DNA activates specific genes and increases the production of proteins all right, tyrosine is uh, the common precursor of your um, amine. Your catecholamines are water soluble, and your thyroxine is lipid soluble. So, your catecholamines was uh, epinephrine and norepinephrine, and your thyroxine uh, is uh, thyroid hormone. And uh, some require um, a carrier transport protein, the lipid soluble ones, and they also activate a secondary messenger system and all um, 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 amines, amines, yeah, am amino acids, amines, are regulated by negative feedback. Okay. Measurement of hormones. Uh, we pretty much measure hormones predominantly by immunoassay. Usually ELISA emit or um, FPIA, sometimes RIA, sometimes HPLC, so high performance liquid chromatography, if you 
I forgot what that means. And then sometimes by GCMS, this is really super accurate uh, gas chromatography mass spectrometry. So it kind of depends on the send out lab. Um, the ones that are done on the machines that are in the lab are immunoassays. Uh, the, um, these tend to be HPLC and GCMS and to be reference lab tests. Okay, so let's think about disease processes in the endocrine system. So um, usually there's disorders of disease that uh, come from tumors, from inflammatory process processes or genetic mutations. Um, if it is a primary disease, it is from the target organ. So it is the target organ that is defective. So let's use um, the thyroid as an example. The, the thyroid system. So if you have a prim primary thyroid disease, it's the thyroid itself that is uh, non-functioning. Okay. Then if we had secondary thyroid disease, the problem could be either in the hypothalamus or the pituitary. And tertiary is usually a, a tumor in the hypothalamus or the pituitary. So just think of it uh, as the level. So for, for um, your, your, um, thyroid, it would be thyroid, and then secondary would be pituitary, and then tertiary really would be hypothalamus. So um, if something was wrong with the pituitary gland, like it was producing too much or too little TSH, uh, and it was doing it all on its own, not from the feedback signals from uh, in response to the levels, for example, of uh, thyroid hormones, then it would be a secondary disease. If it was the thyroid itself that had maybe some tumors or some problems, uh, then it would be, or destruction or something is poisoned it or something like that, then it would be a primary disease, it would be the thyroid itself. Um, and then you have ectopic disease is when you have a hormone secreting tumor and it could be located in, you know, like for example, in the lungs or something like that. And um, it's just decided to turn on a hormone, um, you know, gene and it's just secreting that hormone and it's not supposed to be it's, it, that hormone's not even supposed to be coming from that organ so that would be an ectopic uh, disease all right so let's look a little bit on the uh, anatomy pathology and lab testing okay so first we're going to start with the HPA axis which is hypothalamic pituitary adrenal axis and um, it coordinates the actions of the neuroendocrine system so there's an interface here between the nervous system and the endocrine system uh, and this is stress uh, the interactions control reactions to stress your HPA axis is always related to stress can also re regulate digestion the immune system mood sexuality and energy storage and expenditure so basically what happens is, to sum it up, is if you are stressed, very stressed, so your body perceives this as, the, the, the example that's often used is like, okay, you're being attacked by a tiger or something, or a predator, okay? So, uh, and that's going to activate the stress response so that you can survive. What it will turn off is digestion, immune system, you're probably going to be in a crubby mood and it's going to turn off the sexuality stuff because if you're fixing to be eaten by a tiger, who cares about digestion, who cares about the immune system, and who cares about reproduction because you're fixing to die. Basically, that's the way your body is perceiving it. And then it will, um, the energy storage, it will actually dump more energy in the system and allow you to use up that energy so that you can fight your, you know, the tiger and survive. All right, the hypothalamus is located at the base of the brain. The main function is to maintain homeostasis, so balance, and it receives input from many body system to maintain a steady state. Um, the releasing hormones produced by the hypothalamus are uh, TRH, GnRH, CRH, and GHRH. So thyrotropin releasing hormone, gonadotropin releasing hormone, corticotropic releasing hormone, and growth hormone releasing hormone. And uh, the hypothalamus contains neurons to control the release of hormones from the anterior pituitary. We'll get back to that HPA axis in just a minute. My slides may have been out of order. Um, the pituitary releases hormones in response to hormone release from the hypothalamus or in response to nerve impulses from the hypothalamus. So uh, the anterior is the uh, pituitary response to hormones, posterior pituitary response to nerve impulses. 
So yes, the pituitary is divided into anterior and posterior pituitary. And the infant balloon uh, connects it to the hypothalamus. So hypothalamus is here, pituitary is there, anterior will be located on this side, posterior will be located on that side. Okay, so here's a quick recap of what's produced by the HPA, uh, I'm sorry, HPA, by uh, the hypothalamus, pituitary, uh, and we have anterior and posterior. HPA is stress, we'll get back to that. Okay, anterior pituitary, again, growth hormone for um, tissue growth. It produces TSH that stimulates the thyroid to make thyroid hormones. It produces ACTH that goes to the adrenal gland, gland so adrenocorticotropic hormone. So we go uh, adrenal cortex, which is here, and we get the cortical hormones that are produced. We're going to get back to that here in a little bit. Then we have FSH and LH, which both stimulate the st testes and the ovaries for various reproductive functions. PRL is prolactin and uh, stimulates the breasts and gl glandular tissues to produce milk. And then on the posterior end is these two. We have oxytocin and uh, antidiuretic hormone. Antidiuretic hormone targets the kidney for water reabsorption and oxytocin uh, helps in lactation and bonding with the baby and in uterine contractions and labor. The way I like to say it is usually if you can remember which of these are posterior pituitary because there's only two. ADH and oxytocin, then you can remember that all the others here belong to the anterior pituitary. Okay, so the posterior pituitary, we'll start with it because it has the least. It does not actually synthesize uh, the hormone, but it stores two of them. So uh, it stores ADH and oxytocin. And uh, antidiuretic hormone, ADH, maintains osmolality. And it controls water balance in the body and blood pressure. Oxytocin leads to milk secretion and for the baby to be able to eat. And it stimulates uterine contractions during childbirth. It's also the pleasure hormone and love hormone. So all of that. All right. In the anterior pituitary, again, we have ACTH, adenocorticotropic hormone. The diurnal follows a diurnal pattern for cortisol release high in the morning, low in the afternoon. Uh, growth hormone, um, and so it regulates growth. If you have problems with it, you can have gigantism or dwarfism. We'll talk about that. Prolactin helps secrete milk for the baby. TSH, thyroid stimulating hormone, uh, goes and targets the thyroid, and that will regulate metabolism and body temperature. LH and FSH are your gonadotropins, and they will regulate the production of the gametes, so the egg and sperm, and the sex hormones, so estrogen, testosterone, pro um, progesterone, and all that kind of stuff. Um, and the most common disorders are usually pituitary tumors that then affect the production of these various hormones. Okay, so this uh, graph in your book, I'm not going to go over in each detail because I'm going to look at each one separately, has, uh, again, all of them uh, in sequence, what's affecting what and what's releasing what. So uh, go take a look at that. All right, um, excess pituitary hormone disorders. We have um, syndrome of inappropriate antidiuretic hormone secretion, or SIADH. So um, antidiuretic hormone, of course, promotes the reabsorption of water and when needed and um, it doesn't affect sodium reabsorption so it literally only reabsorbs water and um, so if it um, if you have too much as uh, so inappropriate antidiuretic hormone secretion you're secreting too much antidiuretic hormone it will reclaim too much water which would then will dilute out your sodium and lead to hyponatremia there you go um, acromegaly is, um, this one, again, uh, excess pituitary hormone is excessive growth hormone, and you will see long limbs in adults, and you, uh, measure IGF-1, um, insulin-like growth factor 1 to, uh, assess that. So, um, acromegaly, if you will, is kind of like gigantism, but once your growth plate has closed, you're not getting really tall, but you're, uh, limbs and nose and ears are getting bigger. 
Another one uh, where there's an excess pituitary hormone is hyperprolactinemia. So you have too much prolactin um, and you have a prolactinoma. And so that could cause, for example, the release of uh, milk from the breast when there is no baby present. So that's not a good sign. Always should be uh, checked out. And then you can also have uh, excess of any of these hormones, SCTH, LH, FSH, and TSH. And we're going to look at it specifically in certain systems. So pituitary hormone deficit disorders, we have diabetes insipidus. So that is to, um, a deficiency in antidiuretic hormone. So um, first, you'll have polyuria because it's not reclaiming any water at all. So uh, you would do a 24-hour urine to confirm that there's polyuria. Normal urine output is around 2 liters, or uh, what's in excess of that, then you can consider it polyuria. And then you will want to measure serum and urine osmolalities and urine specific gravity. A low specific gravity with a low urine osmolality is a hallmark of this disease because basically the urine is not being concentrated and all the water that's coming in is going back out. Uh, you can also measure levels of antidiuretic hormone to help determine the type of diabetes insipidus, see if it's central or nef nephrogenic. Um, so uh, sometimes like brain damage can cause this diabetes insipidus if uh, somebody gets a blow to the head and then it damages their pituitary. Uh, and then you also have hypopituitarism and panhypopituitarism. So that could also be if, so again, uh, brain damage from a blow to the head and a damage to the pituitary. And so hypopituitarism is just low levels of all your pituitary hormones and panhypopituitarism is actually all of them. So this could be some of them. This is absolutely all of them are low. Usually, again, indicates... Um, trauma to the head, something that's happened to affect that pituitary. You can also have deficiencies of ACTH, LH, FSH, and TSH, and you can also have growth hormone deficiency, uh, and that's where you can see dwarfism and stuff. Uh, so again, so let's get back to the adrenal glands and the HPA axis. So um, your um, adrenal cortex produces your steroid hormones, your mineral corticoids, glucocorticoids, and your adrenal androgens. Um, and we're going to cover all of these here in just a second. Your adrenal medulla produces your um, estrogen and then epinephrine and norepinephrine. So yes, the adrenal glands can produce androgens like testosterone and estrogen. So this is where, um, and we'll talk about this later um, when we get to the reproductive system, but um, males have a certain amount of estrogen um, that's produced and females have a certain amount of testosterone that's produced and uh, this is where some of this is coming from. All right, so let's talk about the adrenal cortex hormone. Uh, we have aldosterone. So uh, aldosterone maintains extracellular fluid volume and it regulates potassium metabolism. So um, what aldosterone does is it will actually reclaim a sodium and dump a potassium. So aldosterone affects your sodium balance also at the kidneys. And when we're talking about it will dump potassium into the urine and put sodium back into the blood. Um, and so that is to maintain uh, extracellular fluid volume or the fluid volume, if you will, in your blood uh, so to maintain appropriate blood pressure and stuff. Uh, cortisol, the uh, main stress hormone, uh, and it regulates the metabolism of carbohydrates, proteins, and lipids uh, during the stress response. So um, usually it's all to divert it to producing energy and it's not so much to building or maintenance, okay? It does, uh, cortisol does also uh, have diurnal variation. Now it, cortisol is also, your, it's, it is your energy hormone too. And so your cortisol um, values, what's going to do is uh, you're going to, build it back up during the night and then as you get up you have pretty high levels they get they go up and peak somewhere a little before lunchtime and this is why you have more energy in the morning and then as time goes by as they go by they start going down 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 so you have less and less and less and less energy 
and then with and being you know the, some of the lowest levels right before bed you go to bed kind of drop a little bit more and then they climb start building up at night and climb back up and so that's the normal diurnal variation of cortisol to give you a normal pattern of energy in the morning less energy at night and stuff like that if you produce too much cortisol, you are going to have too much. You're going to have um, spikes of energy and stuff in the middle of the night. You're going to wake up in the middle of the night. You're going to have a hard time going to sleep and all of that. And then your androgens that are produced by the adrenal cortex are DHEAS and DHEA. And this is the um, hydroepiandosterone um, and stuff like that. So they're some of the androgens. So the male hormones is usually androgen. So... This is a good chart for you guys to become familiar with. Um, so using your cholesterol, and that comes from LDL, and the LDL is delivering to the cells. Um, cholesterol is delivered to the cells, for example, the adrenal cortical, um, uh, cortical cells, and cholesterol is made into pregnenolone. Okay, then from pregnenolone, your body has to decide what's going to be made. Okay, so we can make progesterone, and then we can go down this pathway. I'm sorry, I did not mean to click that. Give me a second, let me get back to it. Okay, sorry. So going down this pathway and make aldosterone. Okay, so uh, we go progesterone and we make aldosterone and aldosterone is going to reclaim sodium and with it water will move back in so we'll put sodium back in the blood water back in the blood will increase blood pressure okay the other ones are for pregnenolone you can get 17 oh pregnenolone or 17 uh, oh progesterone and from there we can go uh, cortisol cortisone so cortisol again your energy but also stress hormone and you can take this pathway also. That, so the arrows indicate the different pathways of production. Okay, then from here we can also make um, uh, DHEA and, and androstenedione and make testosterone. Okay, and um, so sometimes when we talk about stress, we could talk about the cortisol shift. So basically, if you're super stressed all the time, your body's got to make cortisol all the time, and um, it's going to shift. Um, so into this production and ignore the production here, for example, of testosterone for the guys. And so your testosterone levels are going to go down. And so for guys, that means loss of muscle mass, loss of libido, loss of energy and stuff like that. And then uh, here, if you make too much aldosterone, you can drive your blood pressure up. And that's one of the relationships between uh, blood pressure and stress. Okay, so uh, here is a breakdown for uh, regulation of um, fluid, and we are actually here in the kidneys, and this is uh, your part of your nephron, so you have your renal corpuscle, you have your afferent arteriole, you have your afferent arteriole, and you have your glomerulus here, and then you have part of your tubule, immaculate densa, and all of that. So uh, what happens in the system is if it's, uh, the stimuli here is either decreased renal blood flow, uh, nitric oxide from immaculate densa, diuretics, epinephrine, norepinephrine, erect posture just being up uh, early in the day and all of that, or an input from the sympathetic nervous system. So any of these stimuli here, this will stimulate uh, the these juxtaglomerular cells and stuff like that. Okay, The inhibitors are adenosine uh, from the macula uh, densa, angiotensin 2, your adrenergic blocking agents, aldosterone, recumbent pursuit, posture that means laying down in later part of the day. Okay, and so um, the stimuli are going to basically make you produce more urine and the inhibitors make you produce less urine. Okay, the um, the juxtaglomerular cells and um, macula densa have an influence on uh, by making angiotensin 1. So angiotensinogen uh, can be converted to angiotensin 1, which is then cleaved by ACE into angiotensin 2. Angiotensin 2 then increases your aldosterone levels. Your uh, aldosterone levels, as they go up, increase sodium and water reabsorption. It increases blood volume and increases blood pressure. 
which is how your blood pressure is higher during the day because this is stimulated during being up during the day and lower at night when you're laying down. It's also lower simply when you're laying down. <clears throat> um, other things that can increase aldosterone levels are increased ACTH levels, hyperkalemia, and hyponatremia. So uh, your adrenal medulla hormones <clears throat> are your catecholamines, your epinephrine and norepinephrine, and they are released via nervous system stimulation. They have a two-minute half-life, and which is actually longer than their life as a neurotransmitter. So this is these exist as neurotransmitters and as hormones, adrenal medulla hormones, um, and they coordinate the fight or flight response. So um, they are made from uh, phenylalanine, which is made into tyrosine, which is made into dopa to dopamine, and then dopamine to norepinephrine and norepinephrine to epinephrine. Okay, and all three of these can be released and used, uh, but dopamine can be converted to norepi and epi, norepi to epinephrine. Okay, so epinephrine and norepinephrine have various effects on the body, but think fight or flight. And it's actually, it's fight, flight, or freeze. Freeze is also an acceptable response of distress. But um, it, it, when you get really scared or, and you, the fight or flight response kicks in, your, um, your breathing is going to increase, your heart rate is going to increase, you're going to get more strength, you get blood flow to the, diverted to the muscles and all of that, away from digestion and all that, so that you can fight for your life or run uh, like all get out. But it can also make you freeze in place. Okay, so um, as um, here, I need to note that the breakdown product of dopamine is homovanillic acid, and then norepinephrine and epinephrine are breaking down norepinephrine into normetanephrine and epinephrine into metanephrine, and these are both broken down into vanillyl mandelic acid. Okay. So sometimes you'll see we'll order 24-hour urines and we'll check for homovanillic acid and vanillyl mandelic acid because these guys have an only a two-minute half-life. It's kind of hard to measure them, but if we do, if somebody's overproducing them and we collect a 24-hour urine and we measure the breakdown product of them, what they're metabolizing, and there's an increased amount of these metabolites, then we know there was increased amount of these present during the day. Okay, so let's talk, let's talk about the stress response in the HPA axis. Okay, so you have a stressor, and the interesting thing about the stressor, so the stressor could be a real physical threat to your life. Um, so, I don't know, um, somebody like threatens you with a gun or something like that, you know, gun violence is a real thing, or it can be a perceived stressor. It could be um, a deadline or something, or sometimes there's a perception of some somebody that said something to you and it stress you out and because of how you interpret it. So it can be real or perceived stress. Either way, the stressor is obviously perceived by the central nervous system, your brain, and your brain interprets it and sends signals to the hypothalamus. And the hypothalamus says, oh, we need to stress out about this. So let's release some corticotropin releasing hormone. Okay. So it is going to go to the pituitary, and uh, there's also going to be a sympathetic nervous system response to all of this, to the stressor itself from the brain that perceives it, but also be at a release of corticotropic uh, releasing hormones. So we're going to follow these two pathways here one at a time. Okay, so let's go with the sympathetic nervous system. Okay, so if you remember sympathetic, parasympathetic uh, branches of your nervous system, your sympathetic one is your stress response, but it's also you kind of be awake and get stuff done. So, so you know, there are stresses in, in the body that are just fine uh, or in during the day that are okay, that they, they get you to get stuff done. Okay. So, uh, but, you know, too much of it, though, is not good. So they will release, the sympathetic nervous system will interface with the adrenal medulla and cause a release of norepinephrine and epinephrine. And so some of the effects of, for example, of norepinephrine would be increased blood pressure, increased pupil dilation, increased sweating, um, and um, we have uh, palo erections with goosebumps and arterial, increased arterial smooth muscle contraction. So um, that will cause a uh, vasoconstriction and the higher pressure uh, right here from the high blood pressure. Um, and um, 
we also get vascular growth factor and angiogenic uh, factors also released. Okay, so then on the epinephrine end, we get bronchodilation, so you can breathe better, uh, increased lipolysis, so we're break, releasing fat so we can burn that as energy, uh, increase um, force and rate of cardiac contraction, so your, your heart is beating faster and stronger, that increases cardiac output, which by the way, increases blood pressure also. Uh, so the increase in lipolysis here the, means, of course, there's more fatty acids circulating. And then we have also the effect on the pancreas. We have decreased insulin, which means then your blood sugar is going to go up because insulin is not there to get into the cells, uh, but increased glucagon. So glucagon is going to say, let's go make gluconeogenesis, make some more glucose from uh, the, the non-glucose uh, sources. Uh, so you have decreased glucose uptake in skeletal muscle and adipose and more of it's floating around in the blood and this will increase the blood glucose. I mean you can't read it here but that's what it says there. And you also have an effect on the liver with increased glycogenolysis. So the glycogen is being broken down so again that increases your blood glucose levels and uh, decreased glycogen synthesis we're not worried about storing glycogen. So all the energy is basically gets dumped into circulation so the brain and the heart and whatever can use it. Uh, okay, and then on the posterior pituitary, you have an increase in ADH and vasopressin, so it'll make you retain water, increase your blood pressure, so increase water retention. And the anterior pituitary, you have an increase in ACTH, which goes to the adrenal cortex makes cortisol. Cortisol increases blood pressure and cardiac output. Decreases luteinizing hormone estradiol and testosterone because who cares about reproduction if we ain't gonna live. And increases blood levels of amino acids. And then also increases lipolysis again, um, especially in the extremities. So uh, it will burn fat in your limbs, basically release the fat from your limbs from uh, arms and legs. Um, and atrophy of lymphoid tissue, And but it increases the lipogenesis in the face and trunk. So one of the hallmark of high cortisol levels is going to be skinny arms and leg with lots of fat around the face and the belly. So uh, we'll see here, uh, sorry, a uh, picture in just a second. And then so with the atrophy of the lymphoid tissue, um, you can have either anti-inflammatory or pro-inflammatory effects, depending on what's going on in immunosuppression or enhanced humoral uh, immunity, depending on what's going on. So all kinds of systems in the body are affected. So let's look at a case. So uh, Rachel, Rachel's 45, she recently went to a health fair where her blood pressure was taken. She had uh, moderate hypertension. Uh, she has central obesity, so a lot of fat around the uh, abdominal area. Thin limbs and a round ruddy face. She was not taking any medications. Her blood pressure was 160 over 100. Her fasting blood glucose was 120. Um, 8 a.m. and 4 p.m. cortisol levels were 32 and 30. So uh, look at how it hasn't dropped. You remember we we're talking about in the evening, the cortisol should have significantly dropped. It should not be this high. So what do you think her uh, diagnosis might be? So put that, and when you do your near, near pod, think about that and um, give it a guess. Okay, and then we're going to look at some stuff and see if we can figure it out. So we have uh, the hormonal disorders of the adrenal glands. We have the adrenal cortex. We have hyperaldosteronism, Cushing syndrome, congenital adrenal hyperplasia, and Addison. And diseases of the adrenal medulla, you have pheochromocytoma and neuroblastoma. Okay. With hyperaldosteronism, so too much of the aldosterone, so remember that uh, affects the kidneys, so you will end up with hypertension because of increased plasma volume. Why is that? It's because we, if you have too much aldosterone, you'll be uh, retaining too much sodium, and you're going to dump excess potassium because that's what aldosterone do does. It reabsorbs sodium and dumps potassium into the urine. So you will have problems with hypokalemia because you're losing too much potassium from your blood into your urine. Um, and your hypokalemia can lead to metabolic alkalosis. You'll also, because of that, will uh, may see some polyuria and weakness and paralysis. The uh, increased sodium reabsorption will lead to hypernatremia which of course increases the plasma volume to try to offset it and that leads to hypertension. So high 
blood pressure is a result can be the result of hyperaldosteronism. Okay, so here is another one, um, and so this is not uh, this is related to uh, cortisol. So uh, when we were talking about like abdominal obesity here, proximal muscle wasting, so we got thin arms and legs, slow wound healing, thick skin, and lots of subcutaneous tissue, hyperpigmentation uh, on uh, the back and stuff, uh, and on the skin. Uh, supraventricular fat pad right there, a buffalo hump, so a fat pad right there, um, a moon face with acne, thinning of hair, increased body and facial hair, and truncal weight gain with purple striae, and a pendulous abdomen, a abdomen that just like hangs over here. So these are all uh, from the uh, cortisol, and I don't know why we get to so from, uh, let me go back. So these are all from excess cortisol. So this is Cushing syndrome right here. Cushing syndrome uh, is an excess production of your uh, cortisol. And that, if you think about it, the moon phase, central um, obesity, and then if you combine that with, she, uh, um, or if our, our case, she's got co um, producing too much cortisol and po probably too much aldosterone there. Uh, so it could be she has a form of Cushing syndrome with the uh, high blood pressure, the central um uh, obesity and uh, the moon face and all that. Um, again, congenital adrenal hyperplasia is a congenital, so you're born with it and you have too much uh, of the adrenal tissues and stuff so that too much of these uh, hormones are being released. Addison's disease is the opposite of Cushing as you don't have enough cortisol in some of the other adrenal cortex hormones and these two are tumors. So go back there we go okay so let's go to the pancreas now the uh, um, pancreas is exocrine and endocrine function we had looked at the ex exocrine function in the digestive and um, well in pancreas chapter also and we had briefly talked all we had talked about the endocrine function especially as related to diabetes so let's just quickly go back over just because it's tied to the um, of the endocrine part because it's tied to the endocrine chapter. So the endocrine portion of the pancreas produces insulin, uh, which uh, um, gets glucose into the cell and also promotes the conversion of glucose to glycogen for storage. So insulin is a big storage hormone uh, and is produced after you eat something. Glucagon is its opposite. It will go um, and stimulate glycogen to release glucose and it's triggered during fasting when you don't have any uh, input. Okay, another pancreatic hormone is stoma somatostatin and it's stimulated by glucagon and it blocks digestion, okay, because you're fasting. Makes sense. Um, and then two that are related, all, even though they're not specifically produced by the pancreas, are gastrin is produced by the stomach uh, and it produces the release of gastric acid so that you can start digestion. And serotonin, which contracts the muscles of the GI tract to uh, move um, food along the, the system. Okay, let's talk pineal gland. So the pineal gland produces melatonin. And melatonin maintain, maintains your circadian rhythm. So circadian, remember, have to do with day-night rhythms. Okay, so your bedtime and getting up time is uh, regulated by your pineal gland. It can also regulate um, FSH and LH. So your reproduction and reproductive uh, function is uh, influenced by melatonin by your sleep. It also influences body temperature because your body temperature fluctuates during day and night. And uh, melatonin is also an antioxidant. Okay. So um, thymus, the thymus is part of the immune system. And the hormones that influence it are thymopoietin. And thymopoietin allows the differentiation and maturation of lymphoid stem cells to T cells. And then thymosins, uh, which then uh, they act on the late T cells to mature them all the way. And then let's look at a little bit at the reproductive system hormones. We'll have a specific chapter on it. So the ovaries can produce estrogen, and estrogens are actually a family of quite a few different compounds. The predominant one produced by the uh, ovaries is estradiol. 
uh, and then progesterone is produced by the ovaries. The main role of progesterone is to maintain the pregnancy. And it will also produce small levels of androgens because um, females, we do also need small levels of testosterone to function properly, to have enough energy, sexual drive, and all that kind of stuff. And then in the testes, the testes produce testosterone. This is uh, what produces what here in our graph. Okay, so let's move on to the thyroid gland. So um, the follicular cells of the thyroid uh, secrete thyroid hormones uh, in the form of T3 and T4. The precursor of T3 and T4 are ty is tyrosine, and uh, their production is uh, maintained by a feedback loop with TSH in the pituitary gland, and uh, that is referred to as the hypothalamic pituitary thyroid axis. Um, there are metabolically active forms, which are the free forms, and then there are some that are um, bound to proteins and being transported. That is the difference between the total and the free uh, levels of these hormones. So you have total T4 and free T4, total T3 and free T3. The free T3 are the metabol metabolically active free forms. Uh, their main purpose is to regulate energy metabolism. And your parafollicular cells can secrete calcitonin, and calcitonin is going to influence bone and calcium metabolism. So these are the cells that are around the follicular cells, and so this has nothing to do with thyroid hormone and everything to do with bone and calcium metabolism. So again, your hypothalamus will uh, signal uh, via TRH to your pituitary to release TSH. TSH will go to your thyroid and tell it to release T3 and T4, which give you a negative feedback to stop the TSH and TRH production as their levels come up. Okay, so let's look at thyroid client disorders. We have hyperthyroidism and hypothyroidism. Hyperthyroidism is can be primary, secondary, or tertiary. And... Um, Primary, the thyroid glands affected. Secondary is the pituitary and tertiary would be the hypothalamus. In hyperthyroidism, you have an increased amount of thyroid hormones and usually a decreased TSH, especially if it is primary hyperthyroidism. If you had secondary hyperthyroidism, then you might would have a high TSH with a high amount of thyroid hormones. So that's why doing all of these different levels, T3, T4, free T3, free T4, TSH, and all of those is important. Graves disease is an autoimmune disease uh, with an antibody to the TSH receptor, which allows it to be turned on all the time and thinking that uh, TSH is constantly stimulating it. And so in Graves disease, uh, you have a hyperthyroid state uh, of inc with increased thyroid hormones being pr uh, produced because of an autoimmune process. So again, hypothyroidism can be primary, secondary, or tertiary. Um, usually we see primary hypothyroidism, and that way you, you'll see decreased thyroid hormone levels in the blood, so decreased T3 and T4, free T3, free T4, and an increased TSH, because um, the, the pituitary is going to try to keep stimulating it to produce more, even though it's not producing enough. Now, if you had a secondary hypothyroidism, you might would see low TSH with low thyroid hormones. Okay. The, one of the primary forms of hypothyroidism is this Hashimoto's thyroiditis. It is another autoimmune process, but uh, the antibodies here are to thyrotropin, um, and, oh, to thyroglobulin, and to thyroperoxidase. I'm sorry, thyroglobulin, thyro, thyroperoxidase. Anyway, the antibodies basically are interfering with the production of the thyroid hormones, which is why you have uh, decreased levels of thyroid hormones, and uh, there's also congenital hypothyroidism. So, if as a if a baby is born and not making enough thyroid hormone, they will end up developing what we call cretinism, which is basically mental retardation. They their brain just will not develop if you don't have enough uh, thyroid hormone around. Um, and so with hypothyroidism, there's a low level of energy. With hyper, there's a high level of energy, but like to the point of anxiety and racing heart rate and stuff like that. <clears throat> All right, the parathyroid glands, they produce parathyroid hormone. Um, they regulate calcium through the kidneys and the bones. 
and um, they again have a feedback mechanism that's just uh, it's not um, tied to the pituitary it's just uh, the feedback mechanism is just between calcium levels and parathyroid hormone again they're on the back of the thyroid right there and there's four little glands so they work uh, to um, what happens is they, they perceive a decreased amount of serum calcium, which then increases the parathyroid hormone secretion. The, that will go and act on the kidneys and on the bones. On the bones, it will cause the release of calcium basically from the bones, and that will increase the serum calcium. From the kidneys, it will um, stimulate um, 1A hydrolase in the renal tubule to reclaim some calcium and also to make vitamin D, increase vitamin D. And uh, again, yeah, I'm sorry, the, here's the, your reabsorption of calcium uh, to reclaim calcium. Uh, and um, a decreased proximal reabsorption, um, nephron proximal nephron reabsorption of phosphate. So anyway, uh, but this this will increase vitamin D, which acts on the gut, which increases the absorption of calcium. So all of these effects are to raise the serum calcium and decrease serum phosphate. And you need serum calcium because calcium is needed for muscle contraction, especially heart muscle contraction. So your, your primary objective of calcium is to maintain enough calcium in the blood. And it will do it at the expense of the calcium in the bones. And you require, by the way, enough vitamin D to be able to do that. If you don't have enough vitamin D, it's going to be hard for you to have enough calcium in your blood. The parathyroid gland disorders are hyperparathyroidism. Um, so again, primary and secondary diseases. The primary shows elevated calcium and elevated parathyroid levels. And the secondary, you would have um, just the... Um, you would, yeah, you would have the elevated uh, calcium. Uh, secondary is usually seen in chronic renal diseases is what happens there. Uh, hypoparathyroidism, you can have injury or trauma to the um, parathyroid glands and you would see decreased parathyroid hormone levels. And that is the conclusion of your endocrine chapter. Thanks.